I mean, Stugatz was having a conversation with his old man. Uh, Stugatz, more and more every day, like all of us, is becoming an old man. And his father is 80 years old. And they were talking the other day about how Steph Curry would have 10 more points per game <laughs> if he would simply do the old-fashioned common thing of following your shot. Yep. Lost and art. He I was mean, wondering yes. what happened to the following of a shot. <laughs> Has it been, is it a lost art in the NBA that you know your shot's off as it leaves your hand before everyone else does, and therefore you can get to a spot to rebound the ball if you get a long rebound, as Steph often does when he misses? It drives me crazy for this reason. He knows best where the misses are going to go. He has the best vantage point. The shooter always knows best, and he never follows his shot. And why does he not follow his shot? Because he loves the look of walking backwards as the shot goes in. I got news for Steph. Not all your shots go in. A lot of them, they careen off the rim or the backboard, long rebounds. You need to go after them. I agree with my 80-year-old dad. You know who follows his shot, Stan? Al Horford. He follows his shots because that's what you're taught to do in the NBA. And I'm being serious here when I say this. If Steph followed his shot, I agree with my dad. I think he scored 10 to 12 points more per game. Seriously. So you have him grabbing like five offensive rebounds a game. Yeah. To score those extra 10 to 12 points. Yep. Going back to the three-point line and trying again. Yes. <laughs> Three or four following. Three, yeah. Just is his assessment correct that, uh, guys, that there is a, that it is more of a lost art than it used to be, the idea that you put up a jumper and you don't start preening or running back, that you just follow your shot like an old-school Al Horford. <laughs> so you want Steph Curry, who is all of 6'3", probably 180 pounds, yeah. to shoot – Understand that he's not making the shot, which, by the way, doesn't happen often enough. You don't think is. there are times when he releases a shot where he says that shot's not going in? I'm guessing at that point he sometimes often follows his shot when he realizes I'm telling you he doesn't. when it's that obvious, when he's like realizing that it's going to careen elsewhere. Wouldn't the only way that this would be an effective strategy would be if he consistently missed short? Because otherwise, you're having him take a 28-foot jumper mm -hmm. and then recognize that it's going off side iron, right? going off the other side of the rim, and he's running 35 feet to get there. And then if he doesn't get the rebound because a giant 6'11 guy grabs the right. rebound, then you have him behind on transition defense because yes. yep. he's chasing his own shot. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, though. Follow your shot because he knows where the shot is going, and, he, and not every shot is going in. It's, it's No, no, no. It's become very, very annoying to me, okay? Because he is going for aesthetics, and I don't care. Not every shot needs Stugatz. to look like the greatest shot in the world. Stay with your team. Stay on the same side of the court and help out. Scrap around. Loose ball. Go get it. Offensive rebound, and then start it over again. Stugatz, if you no. shot, if you played with NBA players, right, yeah. and you shot, and you knew you were missing it, mm -hmm. you would know where the missed was going to go, right? Yeah. Do you think if you followed your shot, you'd grab your rebound against NBA players? I'd get there quick. Well, the, guess, well, I'm not an NBA player. But he I'm is. Just saying, but but, but I, I, I get that. But he's also 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, and like he said, right. there are 6'11 dudes who whole contracts are based off of, I'm going to get this rebound. There's not many 6'11 dudes anymore. Oh, let's man. be honest. I mean, there's just not. Right. <laughs> okay, yeah. This is not even taught in basketball. Yes, like, follow your shots? Are That's you like, kidding me? Like when you're nine, and nowadays, like once you get older, it's like get back on defense. Yes. Maybe it's follow through with you your shot. You asked Dan Issel if they taught this in basketball. <laughs> is this is that? this is fundamentals one hundred and one. I don't think it is anymore. Follow yeah. your shots. Of course it is. It's a new game. I don't like the new game. I'm, I'm sorry. Tony, I don't know what to tell Tony, you. Did Tony just shout from the corner of the room? Who is that, Dan yep. Issel? Good you, I agree you, with him. By good the way, question. He was Dan born Issel, in. I have no idea who that is. Nineteen forty-eight. Oh my god. <laughs> well, Stugatz is happy. Sounds like. Mad Dog Russo. Stugatz is now, he is happily descending into yep. what happened to the chess pass. Yep. And Luca, knock it off with all this style and swagger. <laughs> what, what don't you like about Luca? No, no, I'm fine with Luca. No, in general, he just oh. he's advocating for a time and space and place oh. where uh, Havelcheck was just following a shot. No, he wasn't. That's the, that's the whole point. He wasn't. How do you know? 
Because in basketball, you watched all of Hondo's games. No, I'm just all telling you. I'm telling you how basketball works, through guts. Yeah. If you are lifted high, right, and mm. you shoot, you are in essence the first person who has an opportunity to get back. If you're out here r- just hunting your offensive rebound against all odds, might I add. When you eventually fail, they're going back the other way, and then they've got numbers, and no one's back there. You know why? Because the guy who's supposed to be back there is out here following his shot. Right. You're, you're, you're acting like we're playing 21 on a pickup uh, court. But he's not going back to play defense. He's going back so it looks good in the event that his shot goes in. Oh, that's what he's doing. That's what he's doing. You, you act like he's going back there, and he's in the defensive stance. That's not what he's doing. Did Dan Issel play games missing, like, four teeth in the front of his mouth? Yes. Yep. Yes. yes. Yep. That's basketball. Yeah. Because he followed the shot. Exactly. That's basketball? I mean, it is. When I said the other day, the 90s, all of it, the entire decade is laughing at today's NBA, this stuff with Jordan Poole, all of it. Like, man, that was nothing back in the 90s. Nothing. Everyone is laughing at today's NBA. It's terrible. It's a bad you, product. You want to laugh, Stugatz? One time, Zach and I were on the radio during the summer. And we watched Knicks Pacers from 1994, the, the the game where Reggie Miller scored 25 points in the fourth quarter. It's one of the most famous playoff games ever. And everyone's like, the 94 Knicks, one of the toughest defenses of all time. And me and Zach are watching this real time, and we're like, this is some of the worst defense we've ever seen. <laughs> Reggie Miller at one point had 16 points in the quarter. They're on the break. Antonio Davis is dribbling the ball. And I witnessed with my own two eyes Reggie Miller in the corner, having 16 points in the fourth quarter, and Charles Smith decides, I've got to stop Antonio Davis. And so he leaves Reggie wide open in the corner, and, of course, Antonio Davis just passes to him, and he hits another three. It was insane how terrible, Mm -hmm. terrible. I'm not talking about 50s basketball. 1990s playoff basketball. Some of the stuff they were doing was just bizarre. What they were doing was protecting the paint. That's what you do. What they weren't doing was guarding the guy who had 16 points at the quarter ended up having 25 in the fourth. In the fourth? You know who used to follow his shot a lot, though? Reggie Miller. Notorious for it. Check it out. I'm serious. Guys who grab their own rebounds. I believe Reggie Miller is one of the best in NBA history. That's not true. Look it up. Okay, you, you did this. Look it up. You also, I love this as an argument technique. I love this part. It's one of it's one of the best things you've ever done. Wow. When you looked at Amin and constructed the, arm, uh, the, the straw man of... You've seen every Havel check yeah. shot. <laughs> you've you've seen every one. You you came after with Amin on. You don't know how much he followed his shot because you didn't see all of the shots that Havel check took. <laughs> As in, if I did in, in his entire <laughs> career, and then go look it up. Go go look up all his shots, and I'm sure one of them was followed. And Sugats will claim that the, that is the victory. By the way, this is so Reggie Miller was six seven, right? Yeah. And Steph Curry is six six three. Yeah. Career offensive rebound percentage. Basically, this is the percentage of offensive rebounds that were available that this guy grabbed. Mm -hmm. For Reggie Miller, career, 2.2%. Yeah. Right? For Steph Curry, career, 2.2%. Right, but 100% of Reggie's 2.2% was him following his own shot. That's what I'm trying and to tell Steph, you. Yeah. The, the Steph is yes. just bullying some yeah. some six eleven player, but it just getting just elbowing and beat out of the way to go grab Clean the rebound. Box outs. <laughs> Steph Curry. Curry. Just I'm getting in you. there aggressively on the offensive rebound, and when Gobert wants it, he just gets yeah. in there and takes it from him with one arm and with and then looks down on him like, "What were you thinking?" You know, <laughs> like a guy a foot taller than him, paid to only rebound those misses so that Steph doesn't get a second shot. And one of Reggie Miller's All Star seasons he had 30 offensive rebounds in an entire season right and all, all I, I, 30 of them were his misses though. bingo i have said before that the great myth destroyer i could I, when i realized this is an, an illumination right it was shocking espn classic when you go back and look at some of the games it's ridiculous how little defense was being played by any of these teams even during quote-unquote playoff basketball during the My, the michael jordan years like the games were in the 80s, but it's not because they were playing the defense of today. People mistake violence for defense. Yeah. So just because you beat the shit out of Michael Jordan doesn't mean you're playing good defense <laughs> and bad shooting. Guillermo, put it on the poll. Is violence good defense at Levitard Show? 
Time now for Stugatz's top five uh, point guards who have never won a championship. <laughs> oh, this should be good. Very excited about it. I just happen to have it here with me. You <laughs> always do. Yep. Uh, number five, John Stockton. One of the all-time greats. It's a great one. Can Thank you, you. Can you walk me through your top five bookkeeping? Like, is there is there a note section on your phone that's just like eighty top five? It's not in the phone. He keeps them in his sock on yep. individual pieces of paper. I have some on my notes. To be fair, okay, most of them I have written down. They're scattered, you know, somewhere in my desk. They're all in my over sock. Your life. They're in my car. They're I, everywhere. I thought yeah. they were all in your head because when we had the the Rocky, uh, excuse me, the Stallone recap. Yes, that's on Cinephobe. You can catch that now wherever you get podcasts. Hey, I mean, right what's Cinephobe? Oh, it's the podcast where Zach Harper and I watch movies that are poorly rated on Rotten Tomatoes and try to ascertain whether they're accurately poorly rated or maybe they didn't get a fair shake. That's Cinephobe, produced by Anthony Mays. Wherever you get podcasts, right here on the Levitard and Friends Network, part of Metalog Media. Hey, give it a hand. Yeah. yeah. And so Sugats came on in January. Mm -hmm. We had a Stallone month. Yep. And uh, he sat down and he kind of recapped his favorite Stallone movies and Stallone moments. And he had a top five. And there were he didn't look at his phone. Mm -hmm. He didn't pull out a note from his sock. Some are memorized. Right up in the head, right? One was your top five Stallone movies. And then... The other one was top five Stallone roles because they're not always the same thing, right? Yes, correct. Go check that out. You know, it's in the archives. It's a our remix. Stuff, yeah. Our stuff is evergreen. It's remix, exactly. But mm -hmm. Stugatz is an artist. You know what I mean? Like, everybody's here. He's not a bookkeeper. Why does mm -hmm. he have to have things organized? Look mm -hmm. at the great artists of our time. Scattered. They don't Thank Exactly. You. Scattered about. You find all of a sudden, what is this? Oh, the Mona Lisa is just kind of sitting in the corner. I didn't think anything of this, but it's this great work of art that... Da Vinci or whoever painted it forgot that they even did because someone was just going through the studio and now there it is in the museum, whatever Yahtzee. it's called, the Louvre. Yeah, mm -hmm. like you just, sometimes you have these things and they're art and you just dismiss them and you move on to the next thing. You So you have Da Vinci as just kind of like he was just sketching. And yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Before before we get to the top, shit against the, wall. the mm -hmm. top five list of Stugatz's point guards who have not won a championship, I would be remiss if I did not tell people. It's not just Cinephobe. You should also check out Basketball Illuminati because it is very well done. It is different in the space and... Uh, both of Amin's properties here with the Levitard and Friends Network are uh, are growing at a fast rate of speed because people enjoy Amin's work on basketball and beyond. If you could only choose one, which one would you choose? Wow. That's a great question. I'm asking you. Well, what what are my choices? Give me my the two me, podcasts for Amin that you just. I, uh, I would uh, I would say I just didn't know what you were talking about. I didn't uh, realize that the you, thing were still, you were just talking. I know, about, yeah, but yeah. I thought you were still somewhere in Cinephiles, the top five. What I'm talking about. Oh. Oh. Cinephile yeah, is making a, sure you were paying attention. Cinephile is a different one. Cinephile is that one that's not quite performing as well as Cinephobe. Mm -hmm. Cinephile point forward. Which Judd Apatow did? this week, by the way, on Cinephile. Yeah, wow. about that. Yes. I, I, I think it's cute that you guys get these really big guests and still kind of well, lag behind. When us you get in the, the ratings, main feed, bump, you have me you know? on. <laughs> so wait till you're out of the main feed. Wait till you're out of the main feed. I think we have a couple of weeks of non-main feed data that would say otherwise. But go ahead. This is a big month for Cinephobe. This a bunch of reruns. A bunch of reruns. May, no, it's not actually. <laughs> They're We're, remixes. But being outside oh, the remix. comfy confines of the uh, of the main feed is always it's it makes you nervous, doesn't it? Yes, I he's still some, in. He's still in the main feed. He it, hasn't gotten there it, yet. It makes some people nervous, too, guys. You know, for us, for us breadwinners, like you know, it's whatever. Like you know, <laughs> put up numbers. That's so, what I get. Buckets. So, which of the two, if we could only listen to one, should right. we listen which to? One? I think that's I'd the go. Question. I'd go with Illuminati, but uh, but only only because mm -hmm. they're doing it so much differently. And Cinephobe is pretty damn different in the film industry. But I think Basketball Illuminati is more different than everything that surrounds it than Cinephobe is uh, because there are a lot of popular podcasts. Even though it is it is also different, but there are a lot of people talking about movies, though not bad ones, and and doing comedy around movies. Also. In Illuminati's kind of favor, we have this great merch, like this hoodie I'm wearing right now. You can't see it if you're listening, but if you look at the YouTube videos from earlier this week, Monday May Night Show, you'll see me wearing this very handy-dandy Basketball Illuminati hoodie. It's very nice design. Yeah. Shout out to Angel who came up with this, and he really, really, really kind of uh, brought it with his creativity. Shout out to him. And, you know, this is, this is it's comfy, too. I, think I remember you wearing that. You look comfortable. So you're not wearing it right now, right? Mm -hmm. Well, no, I, I, I wear hoodies all the time in here because it's so cold. Right. And it was cold on Monday, no doubt. It's yeah. co always cold in the studio. Was that new? Come on. But this is also on video. 
But you're not wearing it now. Well, no, I, I wore it on video, but I'm wearing it now because I'm still cold. And I didn't bring 80 hoodies because I'm going to Miami. Right. I brought one hoodie. And you know what? If I had to pick one hoodie in the world to wear, it's the Basketball Illuminati hoodie. Boom. You can get that at worldofsui.com, by the way. Top five point guards who have not won a championship, according to Stu Gotts. Number four, Gary Payton. The glove. He won one? He yeah. did win he one. He did win. Here yeah, in Miami. Yeah, but it didn't really count. Yeah, he hit I the mean, big shot. He hit a, like, win one in Seattle with Sean Kemp. That's what I'm talking about. And he didn't do it. I have to take him off the list. You don't have to. It's that's a, unfortunate. You, you, you said personal record book, and your list is slightly flawed, but that's okay. It comes with the package. I'm going to keep him there. On the Stugatz mm-hmm. experience. Yeah. Yeah. Number three. Steve Nash. <laughs> Two-time MVP. Number three on my list of greatest point guards to never win a championship. Billy, what are you laughing about? It's Gary Payton. Just, just forgetting doing, that he won a championship. Here. Italian, he like, went here. Fingers to the, yeah, to the center. But he wasn't really it's here. I, I, I'm looking yes. at it now. I think it may have said Derek Rose. I'm not sure. Uh, a spicy matter. meatball. You you're, you got two fingers up, or you got Art your fingers Billy. your fingers squeezed together. Chef's kiss. Stu God's fourth of his list of top five championships uh, champions who have not won a championship. He chooses somebody who has actually won a yeah. championship. He won it, uh, you know, with other teammates. Didn't win it with his original team. That's very important you got to be a bus know. driver you can't be a passenger yeah i mean he just jumped down here to miami to try to tack on a championship at the end of his career he wouldn't have had to do that if he won one with sean kemp the rain man how about that and george carl tried to do it with the lakers too right failed uh, trying to do it ring chase with the lakers correct was that before miami or after no miami? that was before miami yeah. he, he left milwaukee because he got traded from seattle to milwaukee Went to the Lakers, signed him and carl malone he mm. signed for minimum carl malone got the mid-level exception the mailman yep the glove. Love when Amin establishes his NBA bona fides. Yeah, yeah, I, I had to throw it's that like, out. Like, yeah, mid-level exception, great. Sean Kemp. Yeah. Number two. Number two, Allen Iverson. Some people are going to say the answer is a shooting guard. Yeah. He's not a point guard. And I would answer that by telling you no, he was the point guard on those teams. Because if your point guard is Eric Snow, you don't have a point guard. But if your shooting guard is Eric Snow, do you have a shooting guard? You don't, no. You have a bad team. It's amazing he got that team to the NBA Finals. <laughs> Number one, the number one, he's not going to do this. The number one point guard who has not won a championship, according to Stugatz. Lenny Wilkins. Now, some people are going to say Lenny won one. He won one as a coach. He did not win one as a point guard, did not win one as a player. I've looked it up. I've checked it the same way I checked Gary Payton. Lenny Wilkins, the greatest point guard in the history of the NBA. And check out those numbers, kids, because they will jump off the page. He is the best point guard to never win an NBA championship. So Chris Paul doesn't factor in any. Come on, Stugatz. OLI. OLI. Outside looking in. I'll think about putting him in Gary Payton's place since you told yeah, me he won I'm a championship, <laughs> but I, I'm not certain. I think I scratched that out and wrote Derek Rose. I'm not I'll get back to you. You're looking at the list. Yeah, but it's it's there's it's there's scribbles. There are things I can't make out if you know I've been there. I've been there. Yeah, if the, the uh, Vinci, yeah. if the G is a D and all that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Are you laughing at him saying yeah on the air into a microphone to something only he heard that Billy whispered into his too loud it headset? It was witty. <laughs> you're going to have to explain this to us, Megan. You're one of the great champions, a winner, and you're with us on behalf of quitting. You are sponsored by quitting. You are here to tell people the merits of uh, being a quitter. So explain to what? us why it is that you're sponsored by quitting. You know what, Dan? I'm just done with it all. That's that's really. I feel like you could be a candidate to join me on my quit team. <laughs> you just, you know what? I'm out. Rick. Well, Ricky Williams talks about this that there's a stigma to quitting that there shouldn't be with quitting because a lot of people are in unhappy situations and unwilling to make the changes they need to make in their life. Very true. Very true. That's that's kind of the whole idea about the campaign. Obviously, partnered with um, Schmidt's Naturals Deodorant. Um, you know the. Fa- Amy Schmidt, uh, you know, quit what I'm what I assume would be a, a comfortable nine to five job, one with a little security and probably a little benefits package to do something else. Um, and I think it particularly in sports, I mean, you you hit on it. 
um, it's kind of just this attitude of like, no matter how miserable you are, just keep grinding it out because eventually it'll pay off. And I think we know now it's like, there's nothing that is really worth that. Um, you could win a championship and be miserable. And then it's like, you have a championship and you have all these terrible memories to go along with it. So I think, you know, quitting in an effort to fulfill yourself in something else and challenge yourself in something else and to do something different that you actually want to do, you know, who knows if it'll work out, but something that you actually enjoy doing and you want, I think that's a pretty uh, courageous act. You are viewed as someone who is courageous. What would you say uh, were the most burdensome parts of pioneering that you were not expecting or ready for? I mean, it's interesting. It's like, no matter how much the status quo really doesn't serve the majority of people, they sure do love it. They sure do want to hang on to, um, I guess, just what is norm, what they deem is normal or, um, you know, just sort of knowing the answer, even if they hate the answer. Um, that's kind of what I found. I, I you know, particularly um, for any sort of minority or person of color or, um, you know, woman in the country to continue to live by a set of standards that don't serve you at all. Um, I think a lot of people really dug into that. I think especially my, you know, um, my experience kneeling alongside Colin was just how deeply people were invested in this, you know, sort of white supremacist society that has so many other consequences beyond that. And they just kind of still wanted, wanted to, wanted to be in that. I think people's, you know, I guess maybe it's scared or uncertainty around doing something um, different um, is very powerful, I think. Megan, does the reaction at all scare you? Um, not really scare me. I mean, I think I was more surprised by it. Um, I guess scary in the sense, you know, thinking about where we're at in the country now with Supreme Court leak on Roe v. Wade and that seeming sort of inevitable, I think even without the leak, seeming pretty inevitable that that was going to happen. Um, just kind of continuing to see us as a society choose to go down um, a, a path, which is restricting a lot for a lot of people. I guess that's kind of scary um, and, and scary as a woman right now. But um, I think I always try to have my personality come through as well and the joyous part of my personality. And I think there is joy in doing something difficult and, and struggling, but you're um, doing something that you love. So it's kind of worth it. On the list of things that appall you, how high would be the uh, leaked information that has an overturning possible of a constitutional right for 50 years that will uh, impinge on the freedoms of a woman's ability to protect her own body? Yeah, I mean, it's really scary. And I think what we've seen, you know, immediately in the days following is all of these other bills that are in the works. So it's really not about, um, you know, saving this unborn child, this, you know, saving the future pastor of the church, like or whatever everybody wants to say, like it's birth control. It's your right to leave the state to go, you know, get an abortion in another state. It's, um, you know, taking the, the um, rights away to just make your own choices. That's really scary. We don't really know the full breadth of the consequences that could be. And then of course, like for me, it's like, I, I Oh, well, I'm likely not going to accidentally get pregnant unless something horrible happens, but I would have the means to either have one in my state. I live in Washington or I would have the means to travel somewhere else or, you know, have the money to do that. And we know that this is going to disproportionately affect poor people and poor people of color in particular. And so it's just I feel like particularly cruel. Um, and it's not really about like saving the babies, um, because then we obviously have no universal health care and no universal child care and all of the things. So it's it's very alarming. I hope people understand the slippery slope and the the sort of, you know, sea change that we're that we're in right now. When I have talked to some athletes about leaving sports to be activists for change, they have said that the mental and emotional drain of activism, when you quit sports to do it, drains you more than sports. There's more of a toll on the energies and the physical of the body than the playing of sports. Have you found that? It is tough, yeah. I, I think it's really, um, 
yeah exhausting in a unique way i feel like you're you know you're you're trying yeah you're trying to like push a boulder uphill so even as you are making progress i think there's you know a number of areas where we have you know made progress it just never feels like that and you i think you get the sense that you're ne you could never do enough i mean as a single person like you could literally never do enough you can't change all of the problems in the world yourself so you're kind of always left with that feeling which i think leads to exhaustion and burnout and you know that's why i think self-care and mental health um you know has come so popular for athletes but also for activists and just generally people um trying to take care of themselves because that's just that feeling of never being enough and never being able to overcome the sort of obstacle that's in front of you is kind of demoralizing so that i think is the most difficult part you never can like you know win the playoff series or like win the championship of equality or activism when you look at your resume all of it not just sports what are you proudest of like what are the things that you look at and say like no i'm kind of a badass here i'm i feel good about myself i feel best about myself here i mean i think just being a, a part of all of the off-field stuff of course you know the championships are amazing and that's you know part of why you play the sport but i think the way that you know especially the women's national team and other athletes, you know, female athletes around the country and in the world have been able to use our sport to propel progress, I think is a lot of our um, most proudest moments. I mean, I think, you know, my sport in particular, especially with the national team is, you know, in a much better place than it's ever been. And it'll be changed forever, especially with the equal pay lawsuit and um, you know, our next collective bargaining agreement going forward will put these players in, in such a better position than we ever were. And I think that to me is something that that I'm really proud of. I hope, you know, all the kids are way richer and way more popular and play in better stadiums and, and all the things than we ever did. All right, Megan, I need some help here. I need some advice, OK, because my daughter is going to college next year. She committed to Northwestern to play lacrosse. I'm super excited, but I've also been her coach her entire life. And I think you were coached by your dad as well. So I need to know, like, where where do I draw the line in terms of how much I can embarrass her? Because I've never watched from the parent side of things. OK, so, you know, can I hold a stick? Can I yell at the referees? Can I yell at her teammates? What can I do? Please tell me. I mean, I have, my parents are in very strict instructions to never, yeah, they can like <laughs> cheer for, they can cheer and that's basically, <laughs> yeah. it. they can, they got to stay out of all of the other uh, situations. But, you know, I mean, I think running up and down the sideline with a stick seems Thank fine. you. Yes, yeah. thank you. Okay, good. Well, what about, <laughs> what about you? But no yelling at referees, no yelling. Come, at on. Come on. I mean, sometimes they're bad, you know, sometimes they're bad. So. Is that a yes? That yeah. sounds like that sounds like a bit of a yes. It sounds because like if yes. I Dan, if I tell Rachel Megan Rapino said it's don't, okay, don't, she's gonna be fine with don't, it. Don't give her permission. <laughs> don't give him permission there. I'm that's, doing it. No, that's a terrible <laughs> idea. When when you mention the equal pay, Megan, like what do you regard as uh, the details that would illustrate to us, man? That was a really sucky situation that champion Megan Rapino found herself in during the climb of just inadequate stuff like whether it's payment, facilities, or anything else, just how brutal was it at the beginning of the pioneering? Uh, I mean, at the beginning, gosh, and I wasn't even at the beginning. There's so many before. But I, I think, honestly, the worst part was more the, like, gaslighting of it all. Knowing that, you know, particularly after 2015, after we had won and, you know, stadiums filled and, um, you know, attendance was great and our victory tour afterwards, tons of people, and then still being told like, oh, well, there's not, you know, you don't really make money and no one you know, watches you play. I think that was the, the worst part of it all. Um, I mean, I still feel like I'm owed millions because you can never really make up, you know, I basically was paid like a third of what I, what I should have been paid, which obviously changes the entire trajectory of everything. Um, you know, especially over long, long period of time. But I think it was more in like, I, my thing was always like, you know, we could all make more money. Like we could all be doing better and have a better business and a better business model and structure and everything. And then everybody makes more money like U.S. soccer and us included. So that was always the most frustrating part was like, are you just literally doing this because of sexism and like inequality? Like this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. 
So I think that for me was the, the most frustrating because it was also just like glaringly obvious. We had great stars on the team, great personalities. We were great on the field. We were kind of a surefire business bet because we won all the time. It was like, what do you want? That's like, that's exactly what you want out of a sports team. You want winning. What else can we do? You want something that you can bank on all the time. And we had these amazing personalities on top of that. So I think to me that the sort of opportunity loss is the most frustrating part. Again, Megan has teamed with Schmitz to prove that quitting can be an act of courage, trying to normalize the conversation about quitting in pursuit of happiness. Schmitz, you should know, has created natural deodorant, has no ingredients like aluminum, salts, and uh, she'll tell you more about that in a second. But can you tell me the best stories about how you and Sue Bird have had to tamp down how competitive you are because it's unreasonable in a relationship <laughs> for you guys to play board games and like flip over Monopoly boards or whatever it is ha that happens when competition aholics are in a relationship? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel honestly, I try to stay away from I'm not good at like board games or card games. I wish I was. Um, I feel like it's like a cultural hit for me to like not play cards and board games. I'm like, dang, I, wish, I blame my parents for that. We should, we should have done more of that uh, growing up. Um, we are both really competitive, but I feel like off when we're sort of out of our sport, it's like a nice, a nice little break. Um, I feel like we have like moments of competitiveness, um, but I think overall we're, we're pretty chill at home. It's an, it's a nice little break. Stugatz, are you ready to play? Uh, I know that you've said that you want to play a game with yes. her that is usually uh, unique yep. to stupidity. What is the name of the game, or how are we playing this game? So the name of the game, Megan, okay? And I have to explain this to Dan as well, and he's going to be mortified that I'm doing this, but I want to have fun, okay? Rapino or Rapine, hell no, okay? Now, Rapino is yes. Rapine, hell no, no is no. Sh you got it? Rapino and Rapine, yes. You know what? I play the game on my <laughs> pod. I, I mean, this, 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 no, no, Megan. This is typical. Dan this is what he does. <laughs> no, no, no. Man, it's my game. I invented it, and typical Dan wants to come in and do it his own way. And okay. I'm not having it. So, but okay? so Rapino is yes. And yes. Rapine, hell no, is no. I know it's odd. Rapino is yes, but Rapino is yes in this uh, in this particular game, and Rapine hell no is no. Okay, right, here we here we go. Are you ready? Here we zero, go. Zero 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 ties. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Rapine hell yes because it's I don't want to play those extra thirty minutes. Now, if we went straight to penalty kicks, right? But I okay. This is what I'll say. Uh, okay, yes, Rapino. Right. But it, but the penalty kicks is a is a do or die situation. So you're not doing the five, and then after that, it's just one for one, one for one, one for one until someone misses. I, I feel to God's like that. you've confused her. She went rapine hell yes, which I know one that's not options. an option. Right, right. <laughs> this is because of your. This is your fault. This. Well, is no, 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 no. It's your fault. No, it's your Same fault for fault. confusing everyone. Rapino or rapine hell no. Those are your only two options. Okay, <laughs> right, hell yes okay. is not an option. Okay, right. well, rapino oh, yeah, is yes. Okay. okay, okay. Oh good. yeah, rapino. Okay. Yeah. Rapino is yes. a caveat. I, it's confusing. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. Larry Bird being the best bird to ever play basketball. <laughs> Rapino, which is yes, or Rapine, hell no. <laughs> Rapine, hell no. Yes. Rapine, yes. hell no. Wow, okay. Is, uh, you're going to get aggregated. That's gonna be, it's going to be blasphemous <laughs> for the people of Boston. What else I you got? I know. It's going to be uh, a whole thing. Tightening up the shackles. Rapino or Rapine, hell no. What do you mean? What's tightening up the shackles? It's a soccer term that Chris Whittingham told me. You know, I, tightening oh, up I, the shackles. I have never heard that term. Oh, right? like tightening up the D? Yeah, like parking the bus. Yeah. Oh, oh playing defensive yes. soccer. Yeah, playing, that's it. Parking mean, the bus is perfect. Yes. Yeah, Rapino. I mean, sometimes you have to do that. People always yeah. get upset about that kind of strategy. And I'm just like, your job is to try to win the game. <laughs> so whatever you have to do to win the game, like we I didn't make it. the rules. You know, if yes. you want to sit 11 people on the line, then that's fine. Uh, faking an injury, Rapino or Rapine, hell no. You got to do mean, it, I think. I yeah, mean. <laughs> like, Rapinos, you need to do it sometimes. Sometimes, yes. it's a, you know, it's a moment in a game and you're tired or, yeah. you know, sometimes too, it's like they did foul you, but not enough to make you fall. But if you don't fall, you don't get the foul. So I'm like, I'm falling. 
I'm full. De I love it. Deodorants with aluminum salts. Rapino or oh. Rapine Hell No. It's Look a at you. Hell oh, no. I don't I don't need aluminum or salt in my armpit. Like right. I just I just need freshness. <laughs> He's uh, mad at me because I tried I, to get in on the fun of I, the game. <laughs> I, you can ask more. It's okay. I only have like four more, okay? Okay. <laughs> Diving. Rapino or Rapine? Hell no. It's the same thing as fake uh, yeah, It's okay. not exactly. It's okay. not exactly. Okay. I'll, I'll say Rapine, hell no, but again, what I just said. Sometimes okay. you get hit and it's like it, you're not going to get the foul unless you fall. So you have to kind of dive. Okay. The U.S. men's team. Do it in the World Cup. Rapino or Rapine? Hell no. Oh, that's a tough one. I mean, one. Rapino, sorry, they, they yeah, got to they, they do, gotta do well. We got to go. We have a good team. We have a good team. All right. Dan, you have one? Or, have or? I, I do have one. The okay. way the uh, U.S. men are paid, uh, Rapino or Rapine? <laughs> hell no. <laughs> I would say Rapino, and they probably deserve more. This is what I've been saying for a long time, too. I'm like, you guys, if they're underpaying us this crazy, they're probably taking a little years, too. <laughs> so I feel like we should join forces and get more for ourselves. But, yeah, they deserve to be paid a lot, as do we. Wearing gym shorts to an F1 race. <laughs> Rapino no, no, or Rapine? Hell no. Oh, my God. Shorts, who, did, who just did this? I, I, I did I, see. <laughs> did you guys go to the, yeah. to the Miami? Dan, Dan did in basketball shorts. Yeah, yeah. I I embarrassed, embarrassed, I, I yeah. It's Miami. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I'm with you. I stand with Dan. I am with you yeah. on that. All right. You can Point. wear anything you want these days. D-Wade doesn't even wear a shirt anymore, and everyone's fine with it. Dan, <laughs> Courtyard by Marriott, Rapino or Rapine? Hell no. Oh wow, this is a big one. I mean, Rapine? Hell no, unless I have to. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I got two more. I don't know if oh, Dan Jesus, has another one. It's never gonna I, end. Two more, two more, two more. <laughs> Jumping out of an airplane, Rapino or Rapine? Hell no. Rapine? Hell no. It's, yeah, I'm, yeah, it's too yeah, dangerous. I'm with you. All right, I last. Can die. I know. I'm with you. Last one, Al Horford. <laughs> Rapino or Rapine? Hell no. Strange question. It I is. Mean, I know it's on. Only because I heard this on TV. I don't actually know this, but like Rapino, if they're going to stay in drop coverage, Rapine, hell no, if they're going to actually get up and guard him. You can't just leave Al Horford like <laughs> wide open. Yes. <laughs> he's, he's like a great player. I mean, he's older, but I'm like, if you, especially if you leave him open, let him get in rhythm. Of course, he's going to knock it down. Uh, Megan, best. we will let you go on this note, but tell us all we need to know about Schmitz uh, before you get out the door here, because uh, you're not just trying to sell product. You are trying to make people a little bit happier with the product you're selling. We are. We're, we're trying to encourage people to take a courageous step to quit something that's not fulfilling them. So I got a little thing up on my Instagram right now. Drop your quitting story in the comments. We're picking three winners. We're going to do um, a little kind of like Q&A sesh with Jamie, the uh, founder, and I. And then there's a $1,500 like retreat gift card in there for you to treat yourself to a nice weekend to figure out what you're going to do next after you quit the thing that you hate. So check it out. May, uh, Megan, pleasure talking to you and yes. uh, pleasure Likewise. celebrating your work. Uh, thank you for being on with us. Appreciate it. Love you guys. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye.